Hello and welcome once again to this uh, next Tungsten Replicator Masterclass uh, training session. Uh, my name is Chris Parker, Customer Success Director for EMEA and APAC. And in today's session, we are looking at using the Tungsten Replicator with data warehouse targets. And specifically, we're looking at um, Vertica, Hadoop and Redshift. So what we're going to cover, um, once again, we'll just do a quick recap of Replicator Flow, but this time uh, with the more specific uh, focus on the target side of that. Um, I think we're, we're all, by now we're all very familiar with the uh, extraction process, so we're just going to look at the, uh, the, the apply process. Then we'll look at the specific uh, configuration prerequisites that we need for Hadoop, Redshift and Vertica and, and the configurations and what they look like. And then we'll do um, a little demo and, and set some of these up. So uh, replicator flow. So we all know about the extractor, uh, but how does the applier work? So with Redshift, Vertica and Hadoop, our applier is what we call the batch applier. So previously with um, writing into MySQL, Postgres and Oracle, we used the JDBC applier so that we were writing uh, transactions um, through, through the JDBC applier, converting them into the relevant DML statements um, and, and applying them to your database in real time. With um, Hadoop, Redshift and Vertica, we don't apply via JDBC. Okay, so the, the, the difference is that we, we do replicate real time but it's um it, it's in batches rather than uh rather than the way the the other appliers work and that's so that we can make the most of the, the power of these uh these targets they don't work well if you're just doing single row inserts and updates and then in fact you can't actually do updates um it's basically an insert or a delete so how do we work that well let's look at hadoop first so Hadoop, your applier has taken the THL, so this is your inbound THL coming from your extractor. And the first thing that we do is we convert that into CSV files. Okay, so your uh, insert statements, update statements, delete statements, they got converted into a CSV file, um, which are then loaded up in the case of um, Hadoop onto HDFS, okay, your, your Hadoop file system. We then have a JavaScript uh, process, which takes that CSV file and, and loads that and merges that into, into Hadoop using what we call a materialization process. So how does the materialization work with Hadoop? Well, um, it, it's very simple. Um, if you imagine we have these uh, DML statements, so you've got an insert, two, two insert tables, um, and then an update. Uh, now what we do is we uh, convert into CSV. Okay, so this is your typical CSV file. You would have an insert for the first insert, uh, an I, so the opcode I indicates the insert, and we have the hello world row. And then we have the second one, which is the meet continuant row. Now what we do is we don't do an update. We actually convert an update into a delete and an insert. So this update becomes a delete of ID one because it was, um, it was an update to this row here. And then we reinsert it with the new data. So that's, your, that's what your typical CSV file looks like. But then when we load that up, we need to materialize this in Hadoop and we need to make it presentable as per the original base table. So how do we do that? Well, we simply just collapse it down. So the output that you would get is the, um, the original insert for row one actually disappears because it's, it's been... Um, it's been overridden effectively by this delete and this insert further down. So we see uh, the materialization process will see this and it will say, well, actually, I don't need to do this delete. I just don't need to process this insert. So really all I'm actually doing is this goodbye world insert. So we end up with meet continuant and goodbye world. And that is effectively what your base table would look like after those three DML statements. So that's kind of the materialization. <clears throat> With Redshift and Vertica, um, the, the merge is slightly different and we use staging tables. And I'll explain that as we go into the, into the demo. So with Vertica, exactly the same thing. Uh, the applier writes out to CSV, which is then using the CP import to take it into Vertica, into the staging area. And we then merge that in um, using JDBC calls, which then do the various merges. With Redshift, slightly, pretty much the same, but slightly different. Uh, CSV files in the case of Redshift get loaded into an S3 bucket, okay? Um, from, um, you know, using the S3 command or S4 command or AWS CLI tool, whichever one you wish to use. We load that into S3 and then the JDBC calls load that into Redshift by, uh, 
doing a, a load from the, the CSV files in S3. So prerequisites, um, all of the usual prerequisites that you expect on your source. So you know the, the users, the host files, sudo as Ruby, Java, etc. Um, but we have a few extra different ones for, oh, I've gone a bit too fast then, for our appliers. So Hadoop, first of all, your HDFS um, directory needs to be writable by your replicator user. Okay, so that's really important to have that set up. Um, in Vertica, obviously, you need the user accounts, and you also need to obtain the Vertica JDBC driver. We don't ship that with the product, so you need to obtain that from the, the Vertica website. It's it's free to download, um, and obviously, if you're using um, you know, the, the paid subscription version of, of Vertica, then you will have access to that. So you just need to download that and drop that onto your, um, ex, uh, your applier. For Redshift, again, user accounts, you also need an S3 bucket setting up um, and the various S3 tools configured and ready to work on the host. So that could be, like I said, it could be S3 CMD, S4 CMD, or the AWS CLI tools, whichever you prefer to use. And we also need to build up a JSON configuration file. Um, and I'll, I'll look at that on the, the next slide. The, the key thing for all of these types of appliers is tables must have primary keys. Okay, it's really, really important because of that CSV, that merging process, if we don't have primary keys, we can't do that merge properly and we can't end up, uh, we, we won't know what we're um, processing uh, correctly. Um, so it's really, really important. If we don't have primary keys, this, this won't work. So what is this AWS JSON config that we need? So it, um, we create it after we've done the install and we put it into opt-continuance share and we call it S3 hyphen config hyphen and then your service name. So I've been using alpha a lot of the time through my demos. So that will be S3 config alpha dot JSON. And in there, we need to build up a JSON structure and supply some information. So first of all, the S3 path, so the location of the S3 bucket. Um, and then we have the, the uh, access. So you can either use um, a combination of the access key and secret key or an IAM role. So it really depends on your business use case and your, your own business processes, whether you can use access and secret keys or whether you can use an IAM role. So you just specify either those two or the IAM role. Then the S3 binary. So if you don't want to use S3 CMD and you want to use S4 or AWS, you just supply that. If you don't supply it, it will just take the S3 CMD. And then clean up S3 files. Uh, by default, this is true. Um, and what this will do is once we have processed the CSV file, we'll delete it. Okay, so we won't end up building up S3 files in your S3 bucket. So um, yeah, by default, that's true. So only apply, apply that if you want to disable that. How do you provision data? So we don't actually replicate DDL in, uh, in either of these environments. So that's one thing you need to bear in mind. So um, we, we'll talk about that in a second when we talk about DDL scan. But how do you actually get the data in there initially if you're setting up a new system? Well, there are, there are a few options. You can either have the, the traditional CSV export and import. You know, you can um, work that, you know, get that data out into CSV file and load it in yourself. Um, you can either dump and load through a black hole engine. And what I mean by that is you could, do, you could take a MySQL dump from your source and then you could create um, a temporary instance of MySQL where you create the database that you're importing using the black hole engine. And what that does, if you're not familiar with it, when you import data into a black hole engine, the data doesn't actually go anywhere. It gets discarded straight away, but the process generates binary logs. So if you could, if you set this up, you can then use your extractor, temporarily point it at this black hole instance, import the data, the data generates the binary logs, which the extractor can then process and write into your target. And then once all of that is finished, you can switch your replicator from using the black hole database and point it back to your original proper source and then carry on the replication from there. It's quite a lengthy process. Uh, there is a, there's um, documentation pages which can talk you through that and explain how to do that. If the target supports it, um, you could um, you know, extract the data as inserts if it supports standard SQL. Um, so you could do insert into, so you could just uh, work out a, a way of exporting the data from MySQL as insert statements. Um, and if you're using Hadoop, you can use Scoop and Scoop will allow you to provision that data as well. So object mapping. So in Hadoop, um, a MySQL database is basically uh, mapped to a HDFS directory. A table 
becomes a, a CSV file. And this is where that materialization process comes in, where we flatten those files down, okay? Um, and a row is uh, effectively a, a line in that, um, in that CSV file. For Redshift and Vertica, it's Postgres uh, interface and syntax. So if you're familiar with that, you'll be fine and you'll be able to work through that. Um, a MySQL instance um, becomes a database and a MySQL database becomes a schema and then obviously tables under there. What we also have in Redshift and Vertica are staging tables, okay? Um, and I'll talk about that on this next screen where we talk about DDL scan. So as I mentioned, we don't replicate data um, out of, <coughs> sorry, we don't replicate DDL from MySQL. So you'll create tables and things like that don't, will not be replicated. So you would need to manage that and control that yourself. But with Redshift and Vertica, um, because of the way we use, uh, that we, we load the data and we merge the data, the DDL scan will, um, you, you create the, the base tables and then you also need to create the staging tables. And that this will make more sense when I go through the demo. So I will, I will talk about this a little bit more when we get onto that demo. But a staging table is basically a copy of the Redshift table, but with a few extra columns. And those columns uh, map to the extra data that we put in the CSV file, okay? So I'll talk about that when we do the demo. An extractor config, as, as we've seen before, um, enable heterogeneous service true is the important one there. And then you apply configs. So for Redshift, um, it's pretty much a, 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 an off-board type replicator because obviously Redshift isn't an instance that you install on. So you would have a dedicated EC2 host for your applier. Um, a sample config here, username, password, the port we're writing to, the endpoint for Redshift, the DB name um, that we by default that we go into. And then we enable batch processing. So batch enabled is true. And we're gonna use the batch load template for Redshift. And then we have the service applier block commit interval and block commit size. Let me just talk about Vertica first, and then I'll talk about these because these two properties are apply to both. Vertica config is pretty much the same, a different port number obviously, or whatever port you're using, the same config, Vertica uh, DB name. We en enable batch processing. Um, we, the batch load template in this case is Vertica 6 and the batch load language is JS for JavaScript. So we need those in, that information in. But then we also have this block commit interval and block commit size again. So how does this work? Well, this is where the batch processing comes in. Now, um, these two properties will control how often the applier will actually process CSV files. Okay, so each time you get an insert and you generate a CSV, we won't process it one by one because that would be really, really inefficient and um, would actually be quite slow. Redshift and Vertica work better when you have large amounts of data to process. So what we do here, we have these two properties, the size and the interval, which control that, that flow. The larger, um, the, the larger these values are, then potentially the longer it could take for data to appear on your target. But again, that all really depends on how busy your system is. If your system is generating lots and lots of transactions and lots of data, then you probably want these values quite high and you could still control um, writing into these targets at a relatively decent pace. But what this, hap what this is saying is um, when the applier reaches 250,000 blocks, Generally, that's a row, not always. There are some exceptions to that, depending upon row sizes and things like that. But roughly speaking, it's number of rows. Um, it will process it and it will write it into your target. Or if it gets to 30 seconds and it hasn't reached 250,000, it will write it. So whichever of these two values the applier reaches first, either 30 seconds or 250,000 blocks, it will process and upload into, into your target. Now you can put these values really, really low if you want data to go very, very quickly. But what you will then see is you, you will see that, that Redshift and Vertica just don't, that they can't keep up. They'll, they'll be forever processing because these targets don't work well with small amounts of data. So you want to make the block sizes quite high. Um, now, I, we do have a customer that has a block size of, of 5 million. Um, and a block commit interval um, of like, I think it's about 60 seconds or maybe more, but that's fine because they're actually processing almost 5 million blocks in, in less than 30 seconds. So they're, they're still seeing good throughput, um, but they need these values high because they're, they're, their source system is, is just generating so much data. So really 
the, the takeaway from this is when you're installing Redshift and Vertigo and even Hadoop as well, you need to play with these values and tweak them, um, set them, monitor the, the output of the performance stats, change them, increase them, decrease them. You need to find the value that works best for you and that gives you the best throughput, but without delaying that data appearing in your target. There is no um, kind of easy answer to say you should set it to this. It, it is trial and error based on your own system. You know your system better than we do. So yeah, play around with this to get the, the what works best for you. Hadoop, uh, pretty much the same thing. Um, except data source type here is file because we're it's, we're writing CSV into the HDFS. And if you remember from the mapping, the CSV file is effectively the table. Um, we tell it the, the, the CSV type um, that just overrides CS, the CSVs that we write for Redshift and Vertica are specific for those environments. So this is just setting the CSV type for Hadoop to be Hive. So it's in the right format and it has the right line terminations on it. Uh, batch enabled again, true template Hadoop, load language JS, and then the, the block commit size and block commit intervals again here. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is switch screens and I will do a, uh, a demonstration. What I'm actually gonna do though is only demonstrate um, Redshift and Vertica. I don't have a Hadoop cluster set up um, to, to share with you. Um, uh, so I'm just going to do, like I said, I'm just gonna do the uh, um, Hadoop and, uh, sorry, Redshift and Vertica. Okay, so this is our usual, um, you know, config here so we have the the host on the the left is our um, extractor and then we have the apply in the middle for redshift and then we have vertigo at the end here so first of all uh, my extractor should be running let me uh, just double check that the extractor is going status so we're running but i've offlined at the moment so i've reset everything on here uh, reset all the the values back to zero so we're starting from clean i'll leave that offline for a second whilst we configure here so this is our redshift applier okay so it's a um it's a standalone ec2 box um i've configured this already so this is my redshift endpoint that i've got running um i'm applying the replicate filter here so i'm only going to replicate the hr schema it's probably quite common to, to use the replicate filter with redshift because you don't necessarily want everything um from from your mysql database and i've also got the drop statement data on there because we don't want ddl to come across now I've set my block commit size and intervals quite low and that's purely because I, I don't want to be sitting here for 30 seconds waiting for data to, to move across when I'm, I'm doing a demo. So I've set that low uh, just to, to get data across. So the first thing we need to do is we go to opt continuance software and into our replicator and we can do the tools TPM validate. And that will just check everything on our local host and that's come back clean. So let's go and do the install. And this should be uh, pretty quick, there we go. Um, so now we need to create that uh, JSON file. So opt continue and share. Okay, I'm gonna buy S3 config alpha, oops, alpha dot JSON. And then in here, I'm going to put the uh, the configuration for my um, uh, my applier. So just copy this. I've got this pre-written here. Let's paste that in. So there we go. So I've AWS S3 path. So this is my uh, S3 bucket that I've got set up. I'm using an IAM role. So I've got the IAM role set up. And I'm going to say faults on cleanup S3 files. That's just so I can show you these S3 files being generated. Now, what is important, because I'm using an IAM role, um, you need to make sure that your um, EC2 instance um, has the IAM role associated with it to allow it to write and connect to Redshift. Okay, so there's a lot of um, S3 AWS configurations you need to do for security. This is in the documentation. Um, I recommend you just follow that and get that set up right. So your, your Redshift instance will need an IAM role um, to allow you to connect. And then your EC2 instance will need an IAM role, which will allow you to upload S3 files, uh, sorry, CSV files to your S3 bucket, okay? So I've created that file. I've done my installation. So I can do replicator start offline. I'm just gonna do a start offline first. 
because at the moment I haven't created my um, my schema, my DDL schema. So um, first of all, let's go over to here. Let's see if I have, I still have this in there. So what we're gonna do is say Redshift. So first of all, DDL scan, um, this is going to reverse engineer our schema. If you watched the previous session on Oracle and Postgres, you'll be familiar with, with this now. So you run this once and it will generate the DDL that is applicable for your, for your target. So if you've got a large schema, output it to a file, um, ddl.sql. Um, I'm just going to put this out to the screen because it's quite a small schema and it's, it's just quicker for the demo. So first of all, DDL, my, MySQL, Redshift. And there we go. So we have the create schema and we have the create tables with the various data type conversions. And I've obviously, I've got primary keys on, on um, <clears throat> excuse me, I've got primary keys on all my tables. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this and I'm going to go into Redshift. So it's a P PSQL command, uh, username, um, endpoint, port number, and the database to connect to my password in oops if I can type it correctly and then I'm just going to paste this in so it'll create the schema and create the objects for me okay so that's done now um, we also need the staging tables so what we now need to do is run DDL again for staging and what you'll see this time is we get tables called stage underscore xxx underscore and then the table name. Okay, now if we look and compare employees, for example, here, the first column is employee ID. What we've done is we've actually appended four extra columns here, the operation code, the sequence number, the row ID, and a timestamp. Okay, and this is, the, these tables are basically what we load the CSV files into. Okay, so we take the CSV files, we upload them into the staging tables, and then that merge process I talked about, that takes them from the staging table and merges them into the base table. So the base table you end up with is the a, a snapshot of what your um, actual table in MySQL looks like. Okay, so let's create these tables. And what's important to remember is because we don't replicate DDL changes, if you add a new column or add a table um, into your, your MySQL source, you need to um, add that column into the staging table or you will need to re you'll need to create that staging table so what i would suggest if it's a new table you could run ddl scan and you can just specify the table you want to um you want to do i think it's a hyphen table uh, no it's tables so if you it doesn't want to i've got a typo on here somewhere uh, ba, 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 DBHR tables regions that's why so if you add a new table then I would just run DDL scan for that table copy um, copy the staging table structure copy the normal structure pop it in and you'll be fine um, if you're changing a column adding a column deleting a column then you'll need to do that manually but remember to do it on your base table and your staging table okay so that's our tables in place so let's log out of here now um, and let's, uh, let's bring the replicator online. And let's also bring our extractor online. Okay, so Chips ETL status here. We can see we, uh, we're all connected um, online. We haven't got any um, binary logs yet let's just see we've got that yep now we've got there that's it so we're, we're connected to the extractor and we're online now before I make any changes I want to set up my vertica to use the same extractor so let's get vertica installed as well so uh, we've got the configuration file here everything is set up as I talked about I'm also using the replicate filter here and I've also set the, the block commit intervals relatively low just so we can get that data flowing through Vertica in this instance is installed locally on this host. So I can go to VSQL uh, minus UDB admin. And VSQL, PSQL, it's pretty much the same uh, syntax and structure for navigating around. Um, so you should be familiar with the question, oops, the, the backslash question mark, the help, so the, the usual Postgres kind of 
um, structure. First of all, we need to extract the um, the schema. So first of all, we need the um, this one. So we need the regular tables. So we'll do vertica. So let's copy all of that out. Okay, and then let's do the staging tables. Same process here, add a new table, just um, rerun this for the one table. If you alter a table, then you'll need to alter it in, uh, in Vertica. Okay, that's the structure created. There's no other configs we need to do here. So all we need to do now is opt continuance software and we need to do tools, TPM, validate. That looks good. Tools, TPM install. And there we are, we're installed. So let's do a replicator start. And then let's do TFCTL status. Okay, so what's happened here? is it saying it's unable to go online. Um, we don't have the JDBC driver. So you remember I said part of the prerequisites, make so, sure you have that JDBC driver in place. So um, let me show you how we do that. Okay, so I've already got um, Vertica installed locally. So I don't need to go and source this file from anywhere. I've actually got it already. Now I've already done the installation as well. So typically this you would do before you did the TPM install. Okay, so you would obtain the, um, the, the to the JDBC drive from wherever you need to obtain it from, or if you're locally like me, then you can just simply copy it um, on my host. It's in opt Vertica Java, and it's called Vertica, uh, no, not that one, Vertica JDBC, and it's that one. Um, so I can copy that into the tungsten replicator lib directory within this software path. Okay, so I'll just copy that first of all. Let's do a PWD. So um, in your software install, tungsten replicator, whatever, uh, tungsten replicator slash lib, um, if you copy it there before you do tools TPM install, then the file will be copied to the right place for you. If you, if like me, you've done the install, the driver's not there, you forget, still copy it into this location in case you need to do a reinstall, but also then copy it into the installed path. And that would be opt continuant tungsten, tungsten replicator lib. Okay, copy it there as well. So once that file's in place, we can just do a replicator restart. Like so. And then we can do trip CTL status. Okay, and now we see we're online. So it's just, I, I did that intentionally because I wanted to show you, um, you know, if you forget something, where is it? What do you need? Like prerequisites, all that kind of stuff. So there we go, we have that, um, we have that running now. So both of our, uh, all of our hosts now have a running replicator. So trip CTL status on all of them. Um, so we have the extractor here. Okay, and then we have our redshift applier and we have our vertical applier. I've created our tables, they're all set up. So let's do some data changes. So what I wanna do, uh, we will put this one running on a refresh. We'll put this one running on a refresh just so we can see stuff come through. And then we'll go into MySQL. And let's put some data into our tables. So let me just grab some SQL. We'll do a couple of inserts into regions. Okay. So um, inserts have gone in. Uh, Vertica has got it. Okay. And Redshift's got it. So uh, Vertica and Redshift both have their, their data there. So if I just control C on here, um, so THL list last, uh, if you wanna see the data's come through, so that's our second one, the Americas. Uh, we can see that here as well. There we go. And then we'll log into Redshift. Okay, and we can select star from hr.regions. 
and we can see that data is there. And if we log into Vertica as well, and we can select star from hr.regions. Okay, now let me see, we may have the stage data is still there. It's always a little bit slow when you first um, first query a table. So yeah, the, what we have is as um, when we process a new event, um, so at the moment the stage table has got the last one we did, which was row two. So we can see insert, sequence number two, row ID one, commit timestamp, and then the data. If I do another insert into regions, this table will be emptied and the new one will come in. Okay, so we only empty this just before we load something new in, so you can always see what the last the last row that was processed. So that's the, the staging table. And if we look at the staging table over here, we see the same thing. Okay, um, so if I just quit out of here, now if I do S3 CM, I must have got this in my history, S3, uh, S3 CMD. Okay, so this is the bucket that I'm writing into, and you can see I've now got a, that we create this automatically when the replicator starts up. We have a, a directory under there for the service name. So if I go to alpha, we can see we have two CSV files in there because I, these were two separate transactions. Okay, I didn't do this as one. If I did on a start transaction and these inserts, there would be in a, in a single file, um, because I did different ones. I actually um, can do that now, so I can do a tr start transaction over here. Okay, so this time I did a transaction with a regions insert and uh, with two rows, and I did um, countries with three rows and um, another insert into countries of a, as a single row. So there's our countries, and we can see obviously it's slightly larger because um, obviously there's there's more data in there, and eventually the regions will come through as well. Obviously there's that 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 processing delay that I set up with the block commit intervals. But what I'm going to do is if I copy uh, let's copy this file. Uh, let's copy that locally. Yeah, problem is get, it's not CP. Okay, so there's that file. So if I just cat that now, you can see that's what it looks like. So these are the rows. So I inserted Canada, Italy, US, and then the UK, all within one transaction. So that's come through as um, all of that. And it's all under the same sequence number because it was a, because it was a single transaction that we won THL. So if I do THL list seek no three, there we go. So that's our sequence number three, which has got everything in it. Okay, so that's a typical CSV file. Um, over here in Vertica, opt continuant TMP staging alpha staging again. It's quite a long structure, I know. That's where your CSV files go, but obviously we clean them up uh, with Vertica. Okay, so as we've written them, we process them, clean them. So um, this this directory is where your 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 CSV files will go um, with Vertica. And that's it. That's pretty much the the, the configuration of um, Redshift and Vertigo. It's very straightforward, but there are lots of things here that can can go wrong and can throw you out a little bit. And it's really down to um, making sure you have the right security. So, so with Redshift, make sure you have all that AWS security set up, IAM roles, etc. Make sure your S3 bucket is um, reachable from the host and you can write to it. Make sure you have the config files set up um, with Vertica. It's just a case of making sure that, you know, if you're doing a local Vertica or a remote Vertica, that you have that connectivity. Uh, and also make sure you've pre-created your tables. Okay, DDL scan. So create the staging tables and create the, the, the base tables. With Hadoop, um, the, the process is more complex. Um, the online doc pages will talk you through it if you're interested in Hadoop. You need to download um, within the within the tungsten package there is a, a bundle of hadoop tools um, which will allow you to do um, the materialization process and get that data in there initially and and set all your staging areas up and that's that's all detailed in there um, it, so it's a little bit more complex a few more steps but um, it, it's still you know the, the 
the concept and the process is the same. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch back to my slide deck and we'll just finish off with that. Okay, so in summary, what did we learn? No, we looked at the replicator flow. We looked at the various configuration differences for Hadoop, Redshift, Vertica, uh, DDL scan, things like that. We looked at the configurations, how you get the data in there and how we set it up. And then I did a demonstration of Redshift and Vertica. So that's um, very straightforward, simple, um, and that's the end of this session. So what's next? So in the next session, we'll look at MongoDB. Um, so <clears throat> what I'm doing, I've, I've split these training sessions up. So we had JDBC appliers, we had the batch appliers for data warehousing, and now we're going into the more specific. So MongoDB, is, it doesn't really fit into data warehouse in the traditional sense, and it's, it's not JDBC either. So we'll look at MongoDB as a dedicated uh, training session, how we work with documents, in, in Mongo and how we write to that. So that'll be in the next session coming up very soon. So uh, thank you once again for listening to me on this session. I hope you found it useful and I look forward to speaking to you again very soon. Thank you and goodbye.